Hello and welcome back. For those joining us for the first time, we'll be discussing, or those joining us for the first time, we're going to be discussing chemical equilibrium today. So how do we know whether something's going to prefer reactants or products uh, based on the equilibrium constant? <clears throat> so today mainly we're going to discuss what is the equilibrium, what is equilibrium, what is the equilibrium constant, what is how can we evaluate what the equilibrium constant means? And then we'll look at a few problems involving using equilibrium concentrations to calculate um, equilibrium constants, and also what we can do to modify or what we can do to uh, change equilibrium reactions. So we change an equilibrium equation. How does that change the K? And if you like what you hear make sure to hit the like button at the bottom or if you learn just a little bit something today please hit like it makes me feel good to see that people like my video so on that note we'll go ahead and get started with today's lecture So today we're going to start off with a little quiz um, from what we talked about last lecture, which was mechanisms and energy diagrams. So here we have this simple question. It says, what are the reaction intermediates and the following mechanism? And so this mechanism has four steps. And it tells us, okay, the first step is the slow step. And we're looking for a reaction intermediate. So again, a reaction intermediate is produced in one step and consumed in another. So what we're looking for is something that is produced in one step and consumed in another step. And that's a reaction intermediate. So let's go through this and see if we can find any reaction intermediates. So we look at the first step. We produce HCl and H. Excuse me. In the first step, we produce HCl I and H. In the second step, we use H and ICl. So here you see H is produced in the first step, consumed in the second step. So H is a reaction intermediate. Now in the second step we produce HCl and I and in the third step we use HCl I to give us HCl and I. So again from the first step we formed HCl I. In the third step we consume HCl I. So that is a reaction intermediate. Produced in one step, consumed in another step. Now in steps two and three, we produce I, and in step four, we consume I. So I is a reaction intermediate. It gets consumed and produced in one step, consumed in another step. So the correct answers are HCLI, I. And H. Those are reaction intermediates. Now, if we were to draw this energy diagram, note that the slow step is the first step. So let's draw this energy diagram for you. Hopefully, by now you've become familiar with how we write energy diagrams. We'll just assume it's exothermic. So again, the first step is the slow step. So it's going to have the highest activation energy. We go through one step. We have step number two. Step 
step number three, and step number four. And then we have our products. So again, we have four steps. Step one, step two, three, four. And we actually had three intermediates as well. So this is what, you know, example of what this energy diagram could look like. Now we have talked about substitution and elimination reactions. And so here we're given the following conditions, identify the possible product for this reaction. So here we have a secondary alkyl halide. We have an alkoxide. And if you remember from last lecture, alkoxide is what? That's right, it's a strong base, strong nucleophile. And we have an aprotic polar solvent DMF. And to the right, it gives us the energy diagram. Notice that the products are higher than the reactants. So now we're dealing with a secondary alkyl halide and a strong base, strong nucleophile, and an aprotic solvent. The aprotic solvent should kind of give you an idea that this should be maybe a SN2 or E2 reaction because it's an aprotic solvent. And SN2E2 reactions prefer aprotic solvents. Secondly, the, act, the energy diagram should give you an indication of whether it's going to be SN or E reactions. So remember, substitution reactions are exothermic. Elimination reactions have a tendency to generally be endothermic, but sometimes maybe they are exothermic, but generally they're endothermic. So here you see that the products are higher than the reactants. This tells you it's endothermic. So this tells you that this would most likely undergo an E2 mechanism. So we'll go through and look and see which ones could be E2 products. Well, it can't be the first one, so there's no triple bond. Uh, the second one, no, because we added a substitution. C can be an elimination reaction. D, no, I don't know where this is not even the right compound. And definitely not E. You can't add two double bonds. So C is the most likely product based on the, the compounds given. So just a little review about what we talked about last class. Now let's get into today's topic, equilibrium. So we have equilibrium state and equilibrium constant. So what this tells you is equilibrium means the reaction will proceed either in the forward or reverse direction until equilibrium is established. And the way we know when equilibrium is established is based on the equilibrium constant. So here we have dinitrogen tetroxide, which is colorless. It decomposes into nitrogen dioxide, which is brown. So Depending on the equilibrium constant, if we only start with dinitrogen tetroxide, which is colorless, this reaction will proceed until the ratio of products and reactants gives us the equilibrium constant. So it'll continue giving a brown solution until equilibrium is established. And in equilibrium, the rate of the forward reaction equals the rate of the reverse. So we talked about rates last class. So we set them equal to each other. In this case, the concentration N2O4 is equal to the concentration of NO2 squared times the rate constant. And now we get a ratio of products over reactants or the rate of the rate constant of the forward reaction over the reverse reaction. So equilibrium constant measures the extent of the reaction. So how how much uh, how much products will be formed or how much reactants will be formed is based on the equilibrium constant. So K is equal to the 
products over reactants. And for equilibrium constant and equilibrium concentrations, the coefficients are what you raise the concentrations to. Since there's a coefficient of one for N2O4, we use one. But since there's two for NO2, we have two. So now if we look at some examples of equilibrium constants, here we have the formation of nitrogen monoxide. It has an equilibrium constant of 10 to the negative 30th. And that's a very small equilibrium constant. What this tells you is that it's mostly reactants, very, very little products. This reaction will take a very long time. Now, if we look at the other one, so here we have the formation of CO2 from carbon monoxide and oxygen. This has a K of 10 to the 22nd. So since there's a very large K, it's mostly products with very little reactants. Typically, if the react if the K is between like 10 to the first, 10 to the second, or 10 to the negative two, 10 to the negative one, in that range, we have almost a balance. I mean, not much difference between concentration of products and reactants at equilibrium. So here we have an example. We have this reaction with the equilibrium constant of 10 to the negative two. What would it consist of at equilibrium? So 10 to the negative 2. You know, it wouldn't be A because A is means it has approximately equal reactants and products. That means the K is very close to 1. B says some reactants and products with reactants slightly favored. C is essentially all reactants. D, some reactants and products with products slightly favored, and E, all essentially all products. <clears throat> so C is if K is very, very small. So if K is very, very small, that would be C. And D, <coughs> excuse me, D is if K is very, very or E is if K is very, very large. A is if K is very close to 1. Now, B, some reactants and products with reactants slightly favored means K is, you know, somewhere like, you know, approximately 10 to the negative 1. or 10 to the negative 2, something like that in that range. And D is if K is 10 to the 1 or 10 to the, in this range. I mean, it's a little bit of a gray area, but that's what you get. So based on that, we know that the answer can't be C, D, or E. The answer is D. So B means it has some reactants and products where reactants are slightly favored at equilibrium. Next, in the next example, we have a Kc of 1.5 times 10 to the fifth. So this is very large Kc, which means that, that's right, the essentially all products. Very, very little reactants. So that would be E. Because again, the K is very large. Essentially, at equilibrium, you're going to have all products. For example, when you acid-base reaction, the K is very large because you have very little reactant left in the reaction. 
Very, very good. Now, when we're talking about equilibrium, we got to talk about the equilibrium constant, which is, which is k. And equilibrium constant, again, k is when we're at equilibrium. So k is the equilibrium constant. So when we're at k, or when we're, me, when we're at equilibrium, we use k. However, when we're at non-equilibrium conditions, we use what's called the reaction quotient. It's exactly the same thing, but we call it Q. And Q is the term that we use when conditions are not at equilibrium. Reaction quotient. So when we calculate Q, we compare it to K. And if Q, if we'll see in a little bit, if Q equals K, it's at equilibrium. If Q is greater than K means it's going to shift to the reactants and if Q is less than K it's going to shift to products. But generally we use Q for non-equilibrium conditions and compare it to K. So at equilibrium Q equals K if Q is greater than K, it's going to shift to the left. It's going to make more reactants. If Q is greater than K, it's going to shift to the right, make more products until equilibrium is established. So this only is undergone until equilibrium is established and then it stops. And so if we have an equilibrium equation, again, equilibrium equations are denoted by this double-headed arrow. The general form of the equilibrium equation is the products over the reactants, and the coefficients are what you raise the concentration of products or reactants to. And again, it has to be a balanced chemical equation, of course. So we have two types of equilibrium. We have homo equi homogeneous equilibrium, where reactions and products are in the same phase. So for example, this is only going to be two types. Either they're all going to be aqueous or all gases. That's the only two types of homogeneous equilibrium you can have. The other type is heterogeneous equilibrium. This means you have a, a mixture of gases and aqueous, or a mixture of solids, liquids, and aqueous, or solids, liquids, and gases. These have different phases. And then we'll, we'll examine both types here in a moment. So one thing you have to remember that's very important is that solids and liquids are not included in the equilibrium constant because their measured quantity over the original quantity is roughly unchanged. So let me say that again. Solids and liquids are not included in the equilibrium expression. Equilibrium expression or quotient expression. Again, solids and liquids are not included in the equilibrium expression or the quotient expression because, again, when equilibrium is established, their amounts remain relatively unchanged. 
So do not put them in the equilibrium expression. I know you want to, I know you want to, but don't because it's incorrect. Okay. So here we have a reaction involving calcium carbonate decomposes into calcium oxide and carbon dioxide. And we're going to show you why we don't include the solids or liquids at equilibrium. So we write the quotient expression. And then for again, for solids and liquids, their ratio is one, so they just drop out because one times anything is whatever the anything is. So Q quotient is just directly related to the concentration of CO2. So if you want to affect this equilibrium of this reaction, the only thing you need to do is affect, do something with CO2. Now, as we'll learn later, this could be adding more CO2, removing CO2, increasing the pressure, decreasing the pressure, changing temperature. Those are how we can affect equilibrium. The solids do not affect, solids and liquids do not affect equilibrium. So as you see, over time when equilibrium is established, the relative amounts of calcium oxide and calcium carbonate are relatively unchanged when we have the same amount of CO2. So let's write the quotient expressions for these reactions here. So the first one is a combustion reaction. And again, it has to be balanced. So I didn't balance those. We'll do it up here. So we have NH3 plus O2 gives us NO plus H2O. So we're going to need 2NH3 plus, let's see, 6, 3, 2O2. I'm trying to do this on the fly. So please, if I get something wrong, bear with me. You know. Plus three H two O. I believe that's balanced. Is it? <clears throat> two in. Oh, uh, snap it. Two in. Go through the song and dance. It's six three five. So is that the four? Four. Six. Five. I think that's right. Ten. 10, 12, 12, yeah. So now we write the equilibrium expression for this, or the quotient expression. Q equals concentration of products, the NO raised to the fourth times H2O gas raised to the sixth, all that divided by the, the reactants. NH3 raised to the fourth times O2 raised to the fifth. That would be the quotient expression for this reaction. Now, if we go to the second equation, we find a place to do this. Oh, this right here, we'll balance the second equation. We've got to balance it first. So we have NO2 plus H2 gives us NH3 plus H2O liquid. So we we'll start here, 2 NO2 oops, plus believe it's 5 H2. This 2NO plus 2H2O. Let's see. Uh, 2N, 2N, 4O, 4O. Oh, this just this needs to be a 2. So now we have the balanced equation for the second reaction. 
But notice that H2O in this form is a liquid. So we don't need to include it in the uh, equilibrium expression. So this one is not included because it's a liquid. So now we come here. Q equals So only NH3 is included in the products. And that's the Q expression for number two. Now in number three, we have potassium chlorate decomposes into potassium chloride and O2. So we need to balance this equation. This would be 2 Kc, KClO3. Two Kc KCl plus three O two. So this is the balanced third equation. And notice here that only oxygen is a gas. So what that tells us is KCl and potassium chlorate are not involved in the chemical equation. So Q is only dependent on the concentration of O2. So I'll give you a moment to look over that. And I recommend maybe trying it again after the video without the stuff, without the information on it and see if you can do it. All right. Look at a few examples. So here we have some equations we want to write the QC for. Again, these are unbalanced equations, and I forgot the uh, equilibrium sign. Oh, that looks nice. Oh, we just did all these. Never mind. Scratch that. Duh. All right. So look at this example here. We have iron oxide plus hydrogen gas gives us iron and steam. And we want to know what's the equilibrium expression for this. So here we have iron, it's solid, H2 is a gas, we get iron and H2O gas. So when we look at this, remember what two things are not included in equilibrium expressions. That's right, solids and liquids. So we can go ahead and mark off the solids in this equation. So all we're left with is H2O gas and H2. So anything that's not, doesn't have those two in it, would be incorrect. So we can go ahead and cross those off. So A definitely wouldn't be the answer. B or C, because all three of those have the solids in it. Now with 
the last two, remember equilibrium expressions is products over reactants. So we're looking for the one with water on top and H2 on the bottom. Secondly, the reason why D wouldn't be the answer is because it didn't put the, there's no coefficients raised to the power. So the correct answer in this case is E. That's the correct equilibrium expression. Now we want to look at this one. We have the decomposition of lead nitrate, lead 2 nitrate to lead 2 oxide, NO2 gas and O2 gas. Again, what is not included in equilibrium expressions? That's correct. Solids and liquids are not included, so we can go ahead and mark those off. These will not be found in the equilibrium expression. And so we can go ahead and cancel or cross out the ones that have that in it. So this one, A is no good, B is no good, C and, or excuse me, E and F are no good. So that leads us to C and D. Now 4NO2 and O2 are products. So remember equilibrium expressions, the products are on top. So that means D is incorrect. It has to be C. C is the correct answer because again, we have the products on top. We use the coefficients to raise those concentrations to that particular exponent. Now there are a few things we can do. We can have, there's a few ways we can manipulate equilibrium expressions. So for example, we have this reaction involving SO2 plus O2 gives us SO3. The forward reactions quotient expression looks like this. Now if we flip it, so now the reactants become products, products become reactants. The QC expression is just flipped or it's the inverse of the original expression. So if you flip the reaction, the new Q is just going to be one over the original Q. So we call this the quotient rule. So anytime you flip an equilibrium equation, the new K or new Q is just one over the original K or Q. Another thing we can do, another uh, operation we can do for equilibrium equations is multiply by a coefficient. So instead of saying we, we want to know, you know what's the equilibrium coefficient for two moles of SO2, what about if we did it for like four moles of SO2 or a half a mole of SO2? So now if we took this top equation, shown here, and we multiply everything through by a half, how does that affect the equilibrium expression? So now the equilibrium expression, you can see, we're just uh, raising the concentrations to different exponents. And if we want, the way we can find this new quotient factor, quotient expression, quotient factor from the original one is by raising it to the one half. So we raise the original quotient expression to the one half, we get the new quotient for that reaction. So anytime you multiply a coefficient by some n, you're just going to raise the original quotient factor to that n, or the original k to that n. And this is called the product rule. So these are two operations you can do to equilibrium expressions, or equilibrium equations. So. So let's look at a few. So here we start with this reaction involving hydrogen sulfide decomposes in the hydrogen gas and sulfur gas. It gives us the Kc is 10 to the negative 2. Calculate Kc for each of the following reactions. So in the first one, what do we do to this reaction? Well, we just multiply the equation by three.
So that's what we did. So since we multiplied the equation by a factor of three, the new Q, which we'll call Q prime, would be equal to the old Q, or excuse me, K, sorry, we're doing Ks. K prime is equal to the old K raised to the third or Q. And this will tell us the equilibrium constant for this reaction. And you get one, two, three, six, four point one e to the negative 6. Now if we look at the second example, here in the second example, you should notice two things. First off is we flipped the reactants and products. So the reactants become products, the products become reactants. So we flip the equation. Second thing you should notice is that we multiplied it by one third. So now to find the new K, K prime equals one divided by K because we flipped it and then it's raised to the one third power or the cube root of the reaction. So when we do this, we get about 3.97 is the UK. Let me just double check. If that is correct. So let's look at some more examples of this. So here we have uh, the same equation, but at a different temperature. We have the Kc for the synthesis of hydrogen sulfide. The Kc is given to us as 1.8 times 10 negative 3. We want to know what's the Kc for this reaction. So you notice what we have done is we have flipped the reaction because now the products are the reactants and the reactants are the products. So we flipped the equation. Second thing you'll notice is that we multiply the equation by two. Now to solve for the new K, K prime equals one over the original K. And we're going to square it because we multiplied it by two. We get about 8.6 e to the fifth. That's the new K for this reaction. Let me just double check. Yes, that is correct. And we have one more example. So now we have this reaction, the synthesis of NOCl, from NO and Cl2. It gives us the K, and it says, what's the K for the following equation? Again, the first thing you should notice is that we flipped 
the reaction. I flip the equation. And the second thing is we multiplied everything by three halves. So again, this should tell you it doesn't have to be an integer. It can be a decimal as well. So now the new k, k prime, would equal 1 divided by the old k raised to the 1.5. We get one point O e to the negative seven. So these, again, are two operations you can do. You can flip an equation or multiply the equation by a number. So depending on whether you have uh, gases or aqueous, if you're dealing with concentrations, you use Kc. And if you're dealing with pressures, You're dealing with pressures, you use the Kp. It's the same process, just different terms, whether you're using gases or uh, aqueous. And again, it's for Kp, you have to have gases present. No gases, you can't have Kp. Kp would be zero. The Kp would be the same as Kc. So again, the Product quotient is the same as the products of a reactants. However, notice for gases, we use partial pressures instead of concentrations. But again, it's still it's the pressure of the product raised to its coefficient divided by the pressure of the reactants raised to their coefficients. And so Kp can differ from Kc if there's a change in the moles of gas. So if your equation has a change in the moles of gas, Kp is different from Kc. However, if there's no changes in the moles of gas, Kc is the same as Kp. So for example, if we, in this equation here, we have, well, let's see, let's see. We have two moles of NO, one mole of O2. That gives us a total of three moles of reactants, and we have two moles of products. So there is a change in the moles of gas. So the change in the moles of gas is negative one. Remember, it's always products minus reactants. So we lose a mole of gas. So therefore, Kp will differ from Kc. So Kp is equal to the Kc times Rt raised to the moles of gas. So in this case, since we have negative one, is our change in the moles of gas. QC is equal to QP times RT. We just moved the RT to the other side. So if I was to write this out for you, QP equals QC divided by RT. And the reason it's divided by RT is because, let me write this first. QP equals, so since it's raised to the negative one, it's the same as writing QP equals QC over RT. And then to find QC, we just have QP times RT in this example. Just like this. And again, this is only done if you have a change in the moles of gases. So let's look at an example involving this.
just write down the equation. So here we have this reaction involving gases. It gives us the Kp at 900 degrees Celsius. The same. Uh -oh. Sorry about that. My headphones fell out. So if you didn't hear me for a while, it's because I didn't notice my headphone jack fell out of the computer. So now back to this, we want to calculate KC. Hopefully I had it in. We'll find out in a little bit. So now we want to calculate KC for the reaction. We're given KP. So again, if we remember, Kp equals Kc Rt raised to the change in the moles of gas. And so what we need to do first is determine what the change in the moles of gas is. So we have 1 mole of gas for methane, 2 moles for hydrogen sulfide, so 3 on the product side and 1 for carbon disulfide and 4 for hydrogen, 5 on the reactant side. So this will be 3 minus 5 which equals negative 2. So again R is the gas constant. T needs to be in Kelvin. And now we can calculate the KC. So we have KP. KC Two, nine. So we had simplified that, and now we can determine what KC is. And I get about 2.33. And I think I did it wrong. Hold on, let me check. So be 0.233. And that's in KC. Let me just double check. Yep, 
Yes, that's the correct answer. So that's the KC for this expression. So now moving on. So when we're comparing Q and K, we need to, to compare them to see which way the reaction is going to go in order to establish equilibrium. So since products are on top, reactants are on the bottom, the more products you have, the more it's going to increase your Q, whereas if you have more reactants, it's going to increase, make Q smaller because it's a denominator. So again, anytime you have an equilibrium equation, the first thing you want to do is calculate Q to determine whether it's going to shift to the products or shift to the reactants to reestablish equilibrium. So if Q is less than K, it's going to shift to products. It's going to keep on shifting to products and make more products until equilibrium is established. And if Q is greater than K, it's going to shift to make reactants. There's going to be more react, make more reactants until Q decreases enough until Q equals K. And so that's why we need to know Q in order to see which side is going to decrease, which side is going to increase. Oops. So. Now let's look at a problem involving Q. So here we have this equilibrium equation. We start with 3.4 moles of SO2, 1.5 moles of O2, and 1.2 moles of SO3 are placed in a two liter flask. Is the system at equilibrium? So we need to determine is the system at equilibrium? So we've got to calculate Q and then compare Q to K. And if Q equals K, it's at equilibrium. If not, it's gonna shift in a particular direction to establish equilibrium. So first we need to find the concentrations of each. So we have SO2, three point four divided by two should be one point seven. O two. And it's O3. So now we have the concentrations of each reactant and product. We're going to calculate Q and compare it to K. So SO3.6 squared divided by concentration of SO2, 1.7 squared times 0.175. So Q is 0.167, so Q is greater than K. So it's going to shift to make more reactants. Shift to the left. And lastly, we're just going to talk about how we can use equilibrium quantities to find the equilibrium constant. So here we have this reaction involving uh, hydrogen halide decomposition. So HI decomposes into H2 and I2. 
we want to know what's the K of this reaction. If at equilibrium we have 0.078 molar of HI, and we start with 0.2 molar of HI gas in a two liter flask. So what we're going to use is something called the ice table. So we're going to have concentration of HI, concentration of I2, concentration of H2. And we're going to have the initial the change and then the equilibrium. So initially, we have 0.1 of HI and 0 of H2. And remember that to, in order to solve K, K is the equilibrium concentrations of H2 I2 divided by the HI concentration squared. So we need to know the equilibrium concentrations of all reactants and products before we can solve K. And what we know is initially we started with 0.1 molar HI and none of I2 and H2. So we know the reaction is going to proceed to the products for equilibrium to be established. So we're going to lose HI. For every two moles of HI we lose, we gain a mole of X. So again, for every two moles of HI we lose, we're going to gain a mole of uh, X, or gain a mole of I2 and H2. So at equilibrium, we're going to have 0.1 minus 2X, X, and X. And so it tells us at equilibrium, HI concentration is 0.078. So that's what the HI concentration is. So now we can find out what X is to determine the I2 and H2 concentration. So 0 0.078 equals 0 0.1 minus 2X. Negative 0 0.622. So it'd be 0 0.311 is the X. So that tells us the equilibrium concentrations of H2 and I2. And again, here, this is the equilibrium concentration of HI. So now we have we get that. We can calculate K.
and we get K to be about 15.9. So let me just double check. Yep. So that's how you calculate the KC. So on that note, we're finished with today's lecture. And so I hope you learned something from today's lecture. If you did, hit the like button or leave a comment. And I'll double check to see if the sound was recorded on the first half of the lecture or else I have to redo it. But next time when we, our next lecture, we'll, we'll look at how to calculate equilibrium concentrations starting from initial concentrations. So on that note, goodbye and see you next time.